So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the AutoWare Safe Autonomy Seminar. Today, we have a very, very exciting talk uh, on uh, new approaches for uh, nonlinear control uh, for autonomous ground vehicles. And we have uh, uh, Professor Venkat Krovi's uh, group from Clemson University. Uh, from, and we have three PSC students who will present to us, Ajinkya Joglekar, Chinmay Samak, and Tanmay Samak. They're twins, as you can see. Uh, it's really awesome to have them here. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this topic uh, for uh, you know using the Koopman operator, and uh, uh, what we what uh, the the group here will will talk about is you know their experiences in deploying this in uh, autonomous ground vehicles. And between Clemson, the Autoware Foundation, and Fen, there has been a long uh, collaboration. Uh, Professor Vedkarovi himself is a graduate from uh, UPenn. Uh, grass flab and uh, so this continues our you know ongoing uh, long-term collaboration and so over to you guys so uh, we're very excited to hear what you'll have to share thank you dr Mahara. uh i just wanted to check if i'm loud and clear yeah maybe you can speak a little speak closer to the mic oh okay uh it's good yeah it's okay. this is better yes thank you so much dr Mahara. So my name is Ajinkya Zogrekar, and I'll be starting up with our presentation on equipment operator approaches for modeling and control of autonomous ground vehicles. This is an, I wanted to thank our collaborators in F110, the Autoware Foundation, and UPEN, and our in-house support from the Viper GS Center by GBSC. So the primary motivation for our work stems from the fact that part tracking is a crucial modality for autonomous navigation and its performance can be hindered by modeling uncertainty and parameter variation. So model-based control is typically susceptible to this. On the other hand, we have a host of black box models in form of something like reinforcement learning, behavior cloning, which can implicitly capture the dynamics but fail to offer explainability. So we wanted to explore if we can get data-driven identification to yield explainable models and then design linear controllers to control the system. And the scenario over here is a part tracking scenario for dynamic vehicle dynamics maneuvers, which were designed to test the role dynamics of the system, like the skid packs, lava and fish hook maneuvers. And the outcomes are through a finite dimension Koopman operator-based linear model which we can derive analytically and then utilize for control. So this presentation is split into four buckets. First, we'll highlight the VD-based modeling framework in terms of white, black, gray box model, then highlight the Koopman EDMV framework followed by deep Koopman representation for control. And finally, we have auto drive ecosystem, which is a simulator for cyber physical system enabling this research. So we pursue our deployments in autonomous vehicles on a multitude of scale vehicle platforms, starting from small scale, mid scale to full scale vehicle. The small scale vehicle, like the F110 vehicle, serve as the perfect platform for rapid prototyping of both software and loop and loop type deployments. And it shares a lot of parallels with the full scale autonomous vehicles, such as onboard sensor suite, compute, and autonomous navigation capabilities. In this talk, we'll be focusing on our deployments on the small scale vehicle, on the F110 scale. Vehicle. Starting with the spectrum of modeling techniques, on one hand, you have the classical white box modeling, which is the physics based modeling of vehicle dynamics. On the other end, you have the black box modeling or implicit data driven modeling. So, when you consider the white box modeling, you have high degree of explainability since these are uh, derived through physics based methods, whereas the black box modeling techniques give you a high degree of adaptability. We'll go through pros and cons of each approach and why we need something in the middle to achieve best of both worlds. So starting with white box models, there has been a rich history of literature and system identification in the vehicle dynamics community, leading to vehicle models of different levels of fidelity, starting from a simple single track model for slower motion and just considering your plane dynamics. And then you, as you scale up, you have the double track model and the multi-body multi -body model for the whole system. The advantages over here are we are having explainability in these models, and we can use models according 
to our need and they can be of different levels of fidelity and we can leverage traditional control and stability analysis techniques on them. On the other hand, these model-based control techniques are susceptible to, as I said, modeling uncertainty, parameter variation, and system identification is challenging. Now, if you have, let's say, a tire model, which is the most crucial interface between the vehicle and the ground, that does not scale really well from, let's say, a full-scale model versus going to an F110 vehicle, where you can't just scale the physics linearly to achieve the same outcome. And that becomes a challenge in terms of system identification. Additionally, for nonlinear models, having a, a optimal control for a path tracking problem makes it challenging in terms of computational requirements. On the other end, we have our deployments on the black box modeling, and I'll be highlighting some of our prior developments in the F110 space with black box and implicit modeling. And they can be divided into two buckets, mainly in terms of behavior cloning, which is like a regression problem, and then reinforcement learning, which can utilize the sensor input and generate an implicit model in form of a policy. Starting with behavior cloning, we basically follow five steps for deployment of behavior cloning. First, we gather data as with any machine learning based or data driven approach. We prepare the data by creating a latent space representation of the images. We train the model. And this training basically takes into account that the model needs to mimic a human driver. So it takes the camera images as inputs and strips out the command velocity and the steering angle. We finally deploy this model on the physical hardware. And I want to highlight some of the prior deployments that we did with the behavior cloning pipeline. And these were done both in in-house conditions as well as in outdoor conditions. We had the luxury of open roads in the past two years. Uh, and the problem over here with any data-driven model, which I'll co cover in, the, in a few slides, is that it's all dependent on what type of data we have as well as the quality of the human driver. On the other hand, if we look at the reinforcement learning approach, the model implicitly tries to learn its task based on the reward function. This too follows a similar pipeline to the behavior cloning in which we have to formulate a real person environment and then formulate the problem statement in terms of the reward function, to deploy an RL pipeline to tune it, and finally, the sim to real part lets the policy being deployed on the vehicle. And this has been done now in terms of race line following as well as uh, velocity control for vertical stabilization. As highlighted before, the black box model provides some advantages in terms of the adaptability. We don't need to know the system model and we don't need domain expertise in search to just get going with these type of approaches. But on the other end, they have low explainability, low generalizability, we have sim to real issues and it's highly contingent on the type of data that we have. So the ideal case for us would be to have a nice middle ground where we can extract uh, system information from just data alone. But if that information is now embedded in a linear model, which we can explain and design a feedback control for, that is the best case scenario for us. It brings us to the facet of data-driven identification and modeling for. Before I move on to the approaches that we'll highlight, I wanted to quickly uh, showcase the pipeline that we have built. So if you look at the right, the image suggests the entire pipeline used for the Koopman EVMD framework that I'll be highlighting. We have the indoor mocap operator access system, which enables us to localize the vehicle very efficiently. And this is so that during the data collection part, we don't have to worry about pose estimation. And the video highlights basically the OptiTrack system uh, giving us the state information and then we sending out open loop control commands to the vehicle to perform these dynamic maneuvers. This data is then collected and then we do a discovery of dynamics using Koopman operator theory, which I'll highlight further. So there are two camps to data-driven discovery of dynamics. One that subscribes to SIN, it's typically the fluid dynamics community, and the other is the Koopman operator perspective. 
So the singly is basically just type of regression, but it uses candidate functions, and that has some similarities with the Cookman lifting functions. But if we look at the broad picture, the singly model basically gives us nonlinear PDEs based on the data and the candidate functions that we select. And this is good for something like parameter estimation. Let's say if you know the model of the system, you can put in those candidate functions and the coefficients that you get are basically your parameters that you can find out. But it yields a nonlinear model, which is hard to analyze and control. That's why we rely on the Kuppen operator perspective, where the goal is to attain a linear model in the functional space, and which is well suited to control, control design and it also has some challenges in form of lifting functions, which we'll cover forward. So what is the motivation for our Koopman operator based framework? As I highlighted, we want to get a linear model from the data, and we want to use this linear model to design a controller for trajectory tracking. This framework has been now tested on simulation as well as the real hardware. And we want to showcase two different approaches, mainly in terms of the Koopman EDM setting, and the DKRC or the deep Koopman representation for control. So, what is Koopmanism or what is theory behind Koopman operator? Well, the idea was that Koopman operator provides a different view on the traditional approach, which is the differential geometry based approach to analysis of nonlinear system. In this, we basically hope that we can convert a nonlinear system to a linear system by converting the basis vectors into a different observational space. And there are multiple ways of achieving that. Firstly, with like Kalman, Kalman linearization, then we have the Koopman eigenfunctions method. We have the dynamic mode decomposition and the extended dynamic mode decomposition. To introduce to the Koopman operator-based approach, I'll be sharing an example on the Kalman linearization, followed by our work in the extended dynamic mode decomposition. So consider a nonlinear system highlighted by the red box over here. We have two states, x1 and x2, and the dynamics are given by x1 dot is equal to mu times x1, and x2 dot is equal to lambda times x2 minus x1 squared plus mu. So now we have a nonlinear system. So what does the Kalman linearization say that, okay, if we take a polynomial basis vector, we can essentially convert this nonlinear system into a linear system. So now, if we define a third state as x1 squared, so instead of having dynamics in two states, we now have it in three states, where g being the observable, that is x1 squared. And this gives us a nice linear model of the system. So essentially, what we are doing is that we are transforming the basis vectors from the original vector space to a functional vector space, where we choose these observables. Right now, it's x1 square, and that comes from a standard polynomial library. You can have polynomial library of all the original states that you have, and that can give you a nice representation in this lifted vector space. It's called now lifting because we are going from two states to three states to represent our system. And in this lifted space, the matrix that goes along with the state vector is now called the Koopman operator, which is basically a linear operator pushing the dynamics one step ahead in time. So this is a simple example for showcasing, OK, we can do this lifting for achieving a global linearization. But in reality, that's not the case with everything. For example, if we take the logistic map equation, then we need infinite, the polynomial basis function to the infinite to represent this system. And this is something which is undesired. There are ways to mitigate it, but then the equations and the whole uh, state space system becomes messy. So the Koopman eigenfunction is used to design an invariant subspace. So put it simply, we want an invariant subspace where these dynamics can be represented in a finite dimension. And we don't have to deal with things going to infinity and out of bounds. And that basically has yielded to the modern methodologies to use data-driven frameworks for obtaining the finite dimension Koopman approximation in terms of EDMD and DMD methods. The math of the same is out of scope for this talk. 
but we'll be focusing on the application space and how these techniques can be leveraged. So we looked at the nonlinear system, spy is equal to f of x, and we also showcased that, okay, with the Koopman operator and the observable, the new basis in psi, psi of x, we can represent a linear system. But now if we have control inputs like we did in the last slide, we just make a simple change to append the states along with the control input and that time sequence. Now, how do you use it for constructing this linear model from data? That is done through the Koopman Extended Dynamic Mode Decomposition or EDMD technique. So let's say you have two matrix X and Y, which are your states. And these states are like uh, temporal snapshots of the data. And the difference between X and Y matrix is Y is one time shift ahead of X and U is the control matrix. Now we have defined the concept of the basis function before and this basis function basically lifts all the points of X to this new state space. And then we can analytically construct the A, B and C matrix in this lifted space. The A matrix basically giving us the state matrix propagating the dynamics ahead. The B matrix is associated with the control inputs. Uh, just a note over here, we don't lift control inputs in our formulation. And the C matrix is basically your output matrix, which maps your original space to the lifted space. So how can we use this for control? Okay, we got A and B matrix. Now we can simply deploy linear model predictive control over here. And the dynamics are given by zi plus one is equal to a zi plus b u i, where zi is nothing but the lifted state, which is psi of x. And uh, to highlight this, we have shown an example from our Koopman EDMD approach for f one tenth vehicle, which is that we have considered the states that are observed by operator to be the ones from, let's say, a Dubbin's car model. And because we know uh, the Dubbin's car model with uh, adhere to the basic non holonomic constraints on the robot and give us continuous path formulation. So we have used that as a basis and then designed a candidate function library, which goes from one X, Y, V, V cos theta, V sine theta to the power of V, v cube cos theta, V cube sine theta. That's our lifting function now. And this is constructed analytically through our knowledge of the system. And lift our states, which are X, Y, V, and theta to this uh, basis now, which is defined by psi. And then it gives us A and B matrix like we saw. And this is being used for an MPC. So this is the entire model. We first have the F110 vehicle going direct system in terms of the skip pad, fish hook, slalom, and teleop inverse. We collect the time series data. We do discovery of dynamics through the Koopman EDMD technique. And this linear model is now used to design an MPC controller, which enables us to do trajectory checking. I like this in terms of the part tracking capabilities for all these different types of vehicle dynamics runs, which are designed to, so, which are designed to excite the role dynamics of the system. And and observe that if, if we are able to do trajectory tracking to a good deal of accuracy, that means that we have captured these dynamics in the lifted space. And this is showcased by the deployment on the F110th vehicle. We are still testing out uh, this deployment for multitude of different maneuvers as well as trajectory tracking across a race track. But this is a proof of concept that analytical construction of these uh, candidate functions works. But now, as we can see, there is over there as to why did it work? Because we were analytically able to construct these candidate functions. We had some knowledge of the system, but that may or may not be the case all the time. We can't just have one candidate function library and then train it for a certain type of data think it will work. It will give us a larger domain of linearization. It won't work everywhere, right? And also coming up with these candidate functions is 
is rather heuristic, similar to the hyperparameter tuning of neural networks. So another, uh, another approach to this is the DKRC or the deep Kuhlman representation for control, where instead of manually choosing these lifting functions, these functions are nothing but the weights of a, a deep neural network in terms of an encoder and decoder. We use the uh, neural network for now encoding this lifted space. And that gives us the ability to basically utilize this as a candidate function library, but which is not static, but which is always, always learning with new data. And the advantage of that is that we can basically go through different type of maneuvers and we don't need to tune the candidate functions. It will keep on learning with the neural network to enable trajectory following on the data a type of data that we have trained it on. And this can be extended for continuous learning, as I pointed out, where we can keep on feeding it new data till we reach a saturation point in which the policy or uh, the neural network can basically generalize well over multiple type of uh, maneuvers. An extension to this is something that we are again, working on, and this is in the pipeline right now, is to have this framework extended for not only a single time step prediction, but prediction across a larger horizon. So in this case, if we lift the system using neural networks, we can convert it back to the original subspace. And that gives us the propagation of dynamics from XT to XT plus one. But this can be again sent to the next layer of neural networks which is similar to the first, and this can be repeated across a specific horizon, enabling us to predict trajectory for just a single time step ahead in time, but for let's say 20, 30 time step ahead in time. To summarize, we have showcased the traditional white box modeling techniques, the black box modeling techniques in terms of implicit dynamics, but now we have also highlighted that we can combine the advantages of both. We can have adaptability coming in from data. We can still have explainable linear model out of it, which is constructed either analytically through the Kuchman EDMD that we showcased, or through, and this is, gives us benefit of both the approaches. And I would like to, I would like to ask Shinma and Tanmay to highlight their auto drive framework now which is a major enabler for our developments. Well, thank you, Ajinkya. So uh, one of the things that uh, it comes to developing and deploying such algorithms or approaches is we need reliable uh, ecosystems or um, frameworks set up so that we can efficiently collect good quality as well as quantity of data and then deploy these in real time. I'll be quickly highlighting uh, our efforts in developing the Autodrive ecosystem, which is a cyber physical digital twin ecosystem for developing and deploying intelligent transportation systems uh, at scale. So to briefly give you an overview, what we have here is a test bed, a simulator and dev kit. Uh, referring to the figure on the right hand side, we can see that the test bed or simulator are uh, digital twins of each other and we have a bridge that connects these to the dev kit which can now be leveraged to develop the autonomous driving software stack or the smart city software solutions as well. Demonstrations, we will be highlighting four sample applications leveraging different aspects of this ecosystem. One is autonomous parking, another one is behavioral cloning, third one is intersection traversal using deep reinforcement learning and finally we have smart city management for uh, uh, traffic management solutions. Uh, an introduction of what Autodrive Testbed is. It has a small scale, one is to 14 scale vehicle uh, built from the ground up with Ackerman steering actuation as well as a speed steer uh, capability without any physical modification to the vehicle. And it offers rear wheel drive, front wheel drive, as well as all wheel drive capability. In terms of the electronics, uh, we have standard scale vehicle electronics as uh, F110 platform uses uh, and just some minor enhancements such as lights and uh, indicators and things like that. 
Uh, in terms of vehicle software, we have a low level uh, firmware as well as a higher level autonomous driving software stack that is running on the vehicle and it's capable of connecting with ROS and other APIs so that we can interface uh, this vehicle in a multi-vehicle scenario as well as a distributed computing set. In addition to the vehicle itself, what we have is infrastructure development kit, which has a modular uh, nature and we can basically leverage different modules of parents, uh, road kits, as you can see in, uh, uh, in the right hand side for single dual as well as up to six lanes. And we also have obstruction modules uh, that of different scales and traffic elements and surveillance elements, as you can see. We also have some pre-configured maps uh, so that we can perform benchmark analysis and testing of these uh, systems. And we also, as I mentioned, have a digital twin ecosystem or a simulation of the entire ecosystem. So thanks, Shilma. I'll be now talking about the simulator in detail. So the uh, test bed that you saw has a realistic digital or virtual prototype, which you which which can be leveraged for uh, collecting data or prototyping initial developments of the autonomic algorithms or things like that. So in the simulation part, we are taking care of the kinematics and dynamics of the vehicle, as well as the sensor, actuator, and light simulation in real time. Uh, finally, the aesthetics or the photorealism uh, of the environment as well as the vehicle is, uh, is considered from the autonomy oriented digital twin perspective, wherein uh, the dynamics to be realistic, but your perception stack should also receive realistic data in order to ensure seamless simple transfer uh, in the future. So in terms of infrastructure simulation, we have physical attributes that go into the friction of the road surfaces or the mass properties of the collision collidable objects such as obstructions or traffic elements. And there are some virtual environment elements present in the scene such as virtual colliders. Uh, we can be leveraged for uh, quickly prototyping uh, initial solutions without actually thinking about how they can be uh, deployed in the room. And finally, there are some features that the end standalone application for uh, such as uh, communication bridge, which can be interfaced with the uh, external APIs, such as ROS, Python, C++, MATLAB, Simulink, etc. Uh, different angles to view the scene from, the uh, graphics quality, which can be adjusted uh, based on the computation limit. Uh, so basically, we understand that not everyone has a very high-end uh, GPU access or something like a server farm where they can run the simulator on. So the simulator currently offers three different discrete graphics qualities, which can be leveraged to deploy the, uh, the simulation environments uh, based on the compute availability. And finally, we have uh, native C-sharp scripting support uh, in the source form of the simulator and uh, an integrated machine learning framework uh, to deploy the algorithms from within the simulator directly instead of even installing a single library externally. Uh, the third part of our prototype ecosystem is the dev kit, which is a software development kit for developing and prototyping uh, autonomous driving or smart city applications. So in the autonomous driving toolkit, we have uh, API support for ROS, uh, Python, C++, and uh, conditional support for MATLAB simulink or even ROS2. And in the right hand side of the figure, you can see the smart city toolkit where we have a smart city management server based on the standard web uh, deployment, web app deployment, and where we keep track of our database to uh, record and maintain the states of all the vehicles and traffic elements. And we have an interactive uh, front-end uh, web app, which can be used to visualize the database as well as your traffic elements, such as traffic lights or the vehicles. So now demonstrating four use cases. So the first one is autonomous parking using probabilistic robotics approach. Here we are leveraging the simulator as well as the test bed to show the initial refinement and final deployment of uh, autonomous parking application. The 
The second uh, uh, application is behavioral cloning, which, as Ajinka highlighted, uses end to end learning for capturing the autonomy aspect of how a human driver drives the vehicle. So, as, as he mentioned, we are using the camera frames to predict the motion control commands that should be applied to the vehicle as a human driver. One of the things to note here was the data recording functionality in the simulator, uh, in which what we can do is we can maybe run parallel instances of the simulation and record a lot of data at the same time instead of wasting the, uh, a lot of time collecting data. And what we can also ensure is time synchronicity of this data uh, so that we have good quality as well as quantity of data. In the third application that you can see right now, uh, we are uh, performing uh, an intersection traversal uh, using deep reinforcement learning, wherein there are two scenarios. What you currently see is the single agent learning scenario, wherein the vehicle that is driving from the top to the bottom is the, the one that is actively learning, and the other agents are just uh, kind of dynamic obstacles in the environment. What we also tried was can all of these vehicles learn simultaneously to traverse the intersection in, uh, in a multi agent reinforcement learning setting that you can see. Uh, Shortly. So here the challenge quickly becomes uh, more complex uh, since the conflict zone is, uh, as you can see, pretty large as opposed to the, what was there in the earlier case. So it is quite difficult for the agents to learn to simultaneously coordinate to traverse the intersection. Another aspect here is that unsteered here motion constraint. So the vehicles are uh, constrained in their actuation, wherein the space in the intersection is quite less for the initial exploration of the uh, reinforcement learning pipeline. And the agents have to quickly figure out uh, which actions they should choose before, uh, before it's too late uh, and the other vehicles are coming. And the final application is of smart city management using IoT and video communication. So, a uh, quick uh, side note here is that the vehicle is not perceiving the data. The key motivation of this application was to see whether we can leverage smart city infrastructure to a fault tolerant or fallback option if the vehicle perception system fails. So what you see here is the vehicle states that are being recorded or monitored by the smart city manager as well as the traffic elements and the traffic light states that are uh, controlled using this uh, so smart city manager server can be then uh, can be now leveraged in a centralized uh, compute setting to directly control the vehicle based on the traffic flow and the uh, the near neighborhood of the uh, control setting so what you see here is that the vehicle states are being uh, monitored by the smart city manager and it is directly giving control actions to the vehicle based on the traffic light states or the traffic sign states and in case of a multi-agent uh, multi scenario, this can be expanded to now uh, have dynamic obstacle avoidance capabilities to make the vehicle come to a safe uh, condition and halt uh, instead of uh, colliding or having any accidents. Finally, coming to the future plans. Now, one of the key uh, or major future plans for auto drive ecosystem is to bring uh, various ecosystems together in a tightly integrated and uh, single deployment framework. So currently we are looking at two different ecosystems, the open CAV ecosystem that we have here at Clemson University uh, and the F110 ecosystem, which all of you are pretty uh, familiar about. So uh, we will be integrating this on two different fronts. So first, first one is the simulator itself. So uh, in here, uh, we can see a video of the OpenCAV being simulated in the Autodrive simulator. We are now currently also working on bringing the front end scale vehicles within the simulation one. And on the right, you can see the dev kit uh, acting, uh, uh, being deployed on the active F110 hardware so that we can have the best of all of these ecosystems in a tightly integrated framework. Additionally, from the simulator front, we are uh, also trying to expand the API support for ROS2 and Autoware. 
such that uh, we can now seamlessly deploy our algorithms not only at small scale but at mid and full scale as well to continue the uh, integrated development of uh, this, uh, this uh, autonomy across fields. Just a quick note, uh, Autodrive is a completely open source ecosystem and its source formats and its source files can be accessed on GitHub or like, uh, there are also videos on YouTube and the website in general, if anyone wants to quickly go and try it out. Brings us to the end of our presentation. And thank you all for your time and we would be happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Ajinkya, Chinmay, Tanmay. Uh, so we, we are open for questions and uh, we can have actually a proper discussion now. Uh, so there are two parts. So one was the uh, using the Koopman operator uh, uh, for the first part. And then the second part was the, the, the tools and the simulation, digital twin simulator system. Yeah. So whoever has a question, you can just speak up. So Ajinkya, for the first uh, uh, part, uh, how, how, how did you evaluate like the, the error of you know, using the Koopman operator versus you know, modeling the nonlinear dynamics uh, uh, completely as you, know, you have increased, uh, increasing wheel slip? Yeah. Uh, basically, what we did was since since we are, I'm assuming for incre increasing the use that you mean by, let's say, the skip pad condition where you're continuously increasing the velocity. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a kinematic model in the simulation, uh, the one which was also used in the F110 simulator. And then passed on the same control inputs to it. And we assessed the actual lambda forces, the actual trajectory that we observed from copy track. And we compared that difference with uh, our Koopman based model. It's, it's not highlighted in this slide, but we have that comparison between the, just the kinematic model alone versus the Koopman based model that we have. And we found out that the trajectory tracking was better. If you have like, just a skip pad case. If you train it on that, then of course the open loop response would be much better than having a larger uh, data set where it would it would basically be that it tries to uh, the open loop response would try to be generalized across all the different maneuvers. But then once we deploy an PC on it, we'll be able to control it for the trajectory that was desired. Okay. But yeah. That's, yeah, I guess yeah. that's a that, that question in the chat also. Thank you. The, the question is, uh, can the deep Koopman control adapt when the actual model changes? That is when the friction changes as we drive on the road. Yes, so as I think I already in one of the slides, uh, we, we can have an online learning setting wherein you now can update the parameters of like in case of a deep neural network, you can update the weights and biases of the neural network actively online to now ad adapt it to changing road conditions or e even for that matter, any other disturbances that you can uh, experience when you're deploying or uh, this at scale or at full scale. I would like to add like her, uh, there's one, one more caveat to that. It's it's not only just considering the data in terms of its planar configuration, but then also having a way to estimate what kind of surface you have. This, this type of learning won't be standalone that, okay, just from the data, right now we are considering conditions where we have a dry, dry track with no variation in the slip uh, or the coefficient of friction. And if you, if you have something of a changing scenario, it, it would be 
uh, important to consider that either through camera or some form of sensing to sense that, okay, we have a change in condition. And then for that change in condition, we can particularly adapt. To but estimation in that case would be really important. Great, thank you. There's another question in the chat. Yeah. 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 Are the versions of the coupon based controller that account for uncertainty in dynamics due to the lack of data stochasticity or stochasticity in the environment? Uh, yeah, so when we are training this, two distinct type of data sets. One, as I said, like uh, knowing what, what the error is or where it can be traced back to, it's important, at least in terms of explaining what the model is learning. And in that case, we had two data sets, one without adding any noise, but in second, we added controller noise. And that's how we trained it. And we saw that uh, even if there was noise in the control inputs, it still adapted pretty well without, without issues. And that has been captured uh, in this, EDMB efforts and the paper as well. We have a combination of clean and noisy data sets. And that's how we are feeling. So just to clarify, when the HGP says noise in the control inputs, this control is the open loop controller that is used to collect the data, not the open based controller that is deployed or back on the loop. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, yeah, so yeah. the audience, please feel free to ask more yeah. questions. It's very interesting. Yeah. So one question I had from, you know, a student perspective was that, you know, you did this system identification, uh, you know, with uh, different, uh, within this um, motion capture environment. Maybe you can just describe, you know, how you went about doing that, what kind of, you know, uh, tests that you had, you know, with the skip pad test and, and how you went about doing that to capture this, because I think many uh, people trying to repeat this or, or to get to this stage would, would need to do that uh, kind of system identification themselves also. So, uh, like, I can break this into two parts and the second part, I think the twins would be better able to answer that question. So the type of maneuvers that we decided, firstly, we needed something that can capture the dynamics or excite the dynamics in the first place. And that's why the go-to approach was using the traditional vehicle dynamics maneuver, which can excite the road dynamics and then highlight the steering characteristics of the vehicle if it's if it's trying to understand shook runs or higher velocity skip pad runs. And then the second part comes about the pipeline in which we capture the data and know how it's available to uh, everyone through our repository. And Chinma and Tarma would be highlighting that portion. Yeah, what we essentially do is we uh, define an open loop controller for the vehicle to perform these uh, benchmark maneuvers in the form of skid pad, tissue, slalom, or even random daily operation of the vehicle around the arena. So, just for people in the community who are, who are not aware of these maneuvers, I'll quickly uh, give a gentle introduction or a brief summary of these maneuvers. So, skid pad, as you can see, will apply a constant velocity and steering input to the vehicle, which will make it go around in the circles. And you can vary these uh, set points to now trace different uh, circles of different radio. In fish maneuver, what you're doing is applying a constant uh, uh, throttle or velocity and giving a ramp input to the steering, which increases it gradually from zero to the maximum steering limit of the vehicle. There is one more way to achieve this by keeping the uh, steering angle fixed and then gradually increasing or decreasing the velocity to achieve the same result, but we chose the uh, former way of doing it. And this will basically make the uh, vehicle go in spirals rather than circles uh, in case of uh, in case of a fishing man. In slalom, what we do is you can give a constant velocity to the vehicle and give a sinusoidal or uh, time shifted sinusoidal uh, input to the steering to now uh, trace a sinusoidal curve on the uh, Cartesian space of the actual vehicle. And this uh, is in reality, it's done actually by manually driving the vehicle across a series of cones to test the role uh, dynamics of the vehicle. 
And finally, in random teleoperation, you just uh, because these three maneuvers may or may not capture the uh, dynamics of the vehicle across its uh, operational design domain, we then use random teleoperation uh, to now have a human operator just control the vehicle randomly only with an intention of keeping it within the bounds of the motion capture area to now get the time series data of different longitudinal and lateral uh, control inputs for the vehicle affect the dynamics. And then uh, this data as Ajinka highlighted initially uh, being captured from the motion capture system. Uh, this includes the state of the vehicles that is the uh, positional x and y coordinates as well as the yaw angle. Uh, along with this, we are also capturing the control inputs that are being passed to the vehicle actuators in the open control setting. And uh, both of these are independently uh, published as ROS topics to the central server, which is now recording the data uh, into ROS files. One of the key effects of this data is to have time synchronization and uh, a minimal gradation in any way, because what we will be doing is we will be uh, taking one state, the next time instance state, and then we will be basically stacking all of this together to discover the dynamics of the vehicle. Now, if there are data sample losses or things like that, it quickly leads to erroneous uh, predictions of the linear predictor. So what we also did was uh, applying uh, some uh, pre-processing steps to the data itself, such as uh, smooth plan fitting for ensuring that the uh, uh, time synchronization uh, and uh, sampling rate is constant. And then we use that data for uh, discovering the dynamics and uh, formulating the linear predictor model and then use this in the MPC framework to uh, control the user time. So I'd like to add that uh, we put in a bit of work for understanding like what are the things that can go wrong and how to ensure data integrity. And we have built out a processing pipeline which can actually just take the raw ROS bags and then give it, uh, give the data in terms of the states and control inputs in the desired format at 10 hertz frequency. Uh, additional thing I would like to say is that this data is now available on our Git repositories and we can basically push it out on this thread so that it could be leveraged by the community to uh, approaches and reduce the efforts of manually connecting the data. So what we are now looking at is uh, leveraging digital twin ecosystems to, you know, kind of record near perfect data. So the vehicle dynamics and other aspects will still be extremely realistic. However, the data collection nuances that we face in the real world won't be there. So we end up getting better quality and quantity of data at the same time. We are also planning to see how the data in general affects these frameworks and what kind of data, how much data and all of that will be uh, will be required and the quality as well as the quantity to now uh, efficiently formulate uh, open based inputs. That answers one or two. More Great, questions. thank you. I think there are three questions on online. I'll just read them out for the recording also. So, does the model learned for Koopman control provide uncertainty measures? That is, in the terms of like covariance that could be used for robustifying the controls. Uh, we are currently exploring that thread. So, with methods such as Gaussian process regression or Bayesian neural network, can these be? Uh, coupled with the uh, open based linear predictor models to uh, quantify these uncertainties, and uh, in terms of the prediction as well as the inherent uh, epistemic uncertainties or the algebraic uncertainties that we have with respect to the data in it, the data itself, so that we can uh, intelligently collect more data samples rather than just applying brute force approaches and collecting uh, data across the whole operation uh, domain of the world. Great, thank you. The next question was, uh, how much data does the Koopman method need you know, to get a system model? Do we need like a full or good coverage of data in state space? How to deal with, you know, uh, under or overfitting? Can it deal with the cases that are not in the training data? Um, so that's a that's a good question. And I think that that is a bit open-ended in the sense we we need to figure out how much data is actually required to 
get a good generalization so that the vehicle would work in most cases. But now we are exploring some threads in which, as opposed to looking at the data as a sample of trajectories, if we can parameterize the data, and then that gives us a way of quantifying this data, which can enable us to have, okay, in this domain, it will work, like this range of speed and uh, turning radius, it will work. So that is an actively ongoing process. So just as an example of what we have already tried out, uh, in case of, let's say, speed pad or tissue runs, these maneuvers can generalize uh, better. But when we go to slalom, if you just use this speed pad or tissue data to uh, come up with your linear predictor, it, might, it will not work well enough uh, in the slalom case. So the reason we collected the teleoperation data was to ensure that we also kind of uh, set the dynamics of the vehicle to most of the operational design domain. And that helped us get a generalization across all the standard maneuvers. But yeah, as Ajinka highlighted, we are now looking at exactly how much data is required and how to uh, like more efficiently collect this data to the uh, generalization across different conditions and different maneuvers. Great, thank you. There's a uh, one more question here. Uh, so, in your experience, ca can you have certain samples captured highly incorrectly by the mocap system? And would you have to apply some methods to remove outliers from the data set, like particularly from the approach of that uses the manual lifting function? I mean, uh, the main thing that we need to correct, like every time before we collect data, is to calibrate it, calibrate it, and make sure that. There are some uh, erroneous detection. And uh, confirming that the calibration is correct and the data that we collect is clean. Then more efforts to that before actually dealing with having these outliers show in the plots. Yeah, so there are a lot of problems that come with the real world data specifically. So with mocap systems, uh, the first thing as I think highlighted is the calibration. The second thing for the control inputs of the vehicle, the vehicle itself has to be calibrated so that you know that the velocity and steering commands that are being applied to the vehicle are actually being realized in the vehicle. The third and the most important thing is even despite all of these uh, measures that you take, you will end up getting a lot of or at least some data that is erroneous and incorrect. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, OptiTrack uses IR-based tracking of the reflective markers that you can see on the vehicle. And these markers may not be visible to uh, all of the cameras at once. And if that happens, uh, there, are, there is a chance that your uh, tracking will be lost for at least one frame. It, it is recording, the like, mocap system is recording and tracking the vehicle at 120 hertz. So if like you can think that, okay, it's okay to miss out one or two instances in that. But now when you come to think of applying this data in a time series format to predict the dynamics of the vehicle, it becomes challenging because at some points you have just lost the data and it will give you some errorless readings or even not a number of readings. And yeah, you will have to uh, pre-process the data. You will have to check the data integrity a lot before even uh, formula, starting to formulate with those uh, EDMD efforts. Great, thank you. I think that there are two final questions. So, you know, is there any system in this Koopman method that, that it cannot be applied to? It has been shown to work on highly uh, non-linear systems, chaotic systems, fluid flows. Uh, it's recently gained popularity and developments are being made in the robotic space. So I'm not sure any uh, particular domain that it can't be applied to or it has its own theoretical limitations in that sense. Okay, and a final question was, uh... Uh, could you please elaborate the difference between the Cindy and the Koopman methods? Yeah. Uh, that's why I've picked up this one. So basically, 
just a second. Yeah, so Cindy is basically sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. And the premise over there is pretty simple that similar to Koopman, where we have lifting, it's not exactly lifting, but it's multiplying the original states with a candidate function library. So you're basically creating permutations and combinations with different basis vectors. And what you're doing is doing a regression. So right now, dA by dt, if you see in the image on top, top left, dA by dt is equal to phi of A times C. In that, it gives the coefficients associated with those candidate terms that you take. Whereas in Koopman, what you're doing is basically you're changing the basis of your original state vector, and then you're trying to formulate or trying to identify a linear predictor which moves dynamics ahead in time. And the main uh, the main difference is the EDMD technique that we have versus with Cindy with just a regression, you get a nonlinear PDE, and which is good for obviously just predicting. Uh, predicting and not essentially for control because we land up in the same problems that we have with other nonlinear models. This, there is a case that can be made like for simpler systems, you can actually just construct certain candidate functions in Cindy and it could give you a linear model, similar to what we saw for, uh, for the Kahneman linearization example. But the main difference over there is that Cindy gives you nonlinear dynamic to uh, PDEs. And the Koopman operator now is a linear operator, which, which we can use for control design. Uh, Dr. Mamara, you are, you are on mute. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I think that. Uh... Uh, wraps it up for today. Uh, this was a very, very interesting conversation. I think, as you can see by the number of questions, uh, there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, and uh, 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 the, uh, the team here has shared their data and the auto drive simulator uh, system also. So please take a look and feel free to reach out to them. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Ajinkya, Tanmay, and Chinmay, and Professor Krovi. Have a good week.